Dear participants, welcome to our webinar. Um, I'm really happy to um, say hello to you today. Um, and today we have thought about the topic and um, now whether you are an online shop or a consulting business, the website is usually the first frontier and the most frequently used source for your customers to find you. And analyzing the data that is coming from your website is an important step in the decision-making process. So nearly all of the business decisions today are made on the basis of the data. And that's why the data quality is such an important factor in benefiting from these uh, decisions. In the meantime, the data protection authorities are currently scrutinizing the data collection practices for um, in many businesses. And we all know about the decisions uh, on Google Analytics, Facebook, most recently on Criteo, um, that are in effect restricting the legal framework for ways and methods to collect personal data through your website. So the question we want to explore in detail today is how do we achieve the quality of data and in the meantime do not compromise on data protection compliance. To answer this fundamental question, um, we first want to uh, talk about what is uh, tracking and with a focus on server-side tracking, uh, Lauren and Thomas, our my co-hosts today, will uh, talk about how do you achieve and what is it uh, meant by data quality and what is the legal framework for server-side tracking. In the second part, uh, we would like to go through the most important steps toward data, data quality and data compliance. And in the end, uh, we will take 10 to 15 minutes to answer all of your questions. Um, I, I therefore ask all of you who joined our webinar today to post uh, your questions in the chat. Feel free to do so. Um, anytime at your convenience. Before we continue, I would like to introduce myself and my great co-hosts. So my name is Mira Sulimenova. I'm the legal counsel at Gentis, and I have the honor to moderate the discussion today. Uh, I'm joined by Lorene and Thomas. Uh, Lorene is an experienced data protection consultant and is an acting external DPO to many European companies. Thomas has been working in the field of online marketing for many years and now is heading Gentis as a co-CEO. Both of them are extremely knowledgeable about tracking technologies and data protection. I think it would be best if uh, Lorene and Thomas tell more about themselves and their companies. Lorene, please introduce yourself and tell us more about DataGuard. Thank you, Mira. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Laurin. I'm senior privacy consultant by DataGuard. Um, I studied law in Vienna, um, worked in a law firm for several years, and now I'm a um, consultant with DataGuard. So I'm consulting all clients in all questions regarding privacy. What is DataGuard? Um, DataGuard is a tech company with a software as a service solution. We built a platform that automates as many privacy related processes as possible. But we are not only a tech company, we're also a consulting firm. All our customers have access to our in-house team of experts where, uh, that are always available for all questions regarding privacy. I'm one of them. Um, DataGuard has three pillars, privacy, information security, and compliance. We have more than 2,500 customers um, from Germany, Austria, and UK. 200 team members from over 20 different countries and offices in Munich, London, Berlin, and Vienna. What do we do? We are not protecting data. We are protecting the people behind the data. And how we do that? By helping companies being compliant. So that is, in a nutshell, what DataGuard is. Thank you, Lori, for this introduction. Um, Thomas, uh, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself, too. Of course. Thank you, Mira. So my name is Thomas. Um, as Mira told you, I'm co-CEO um, at Gentis. I'm one of the founders, um, and I am originally coming from the software uh, 
development topic. So I started 2016 with two colleagues, with Christian and Walter, um, working on a, a really bad issue we had at the time with data quality um, at our tracking customers. And we decided to, to, to play around it, to try the new technology, server-side tracking. So in 2020, we then decided to found a new company, um, Gentis, with two more founders, Klaus and, and Dropshi. Uh, so we are five founders. Um, I'm by myself, I'm responsible for the product development um, at the company. Our headquarters is in Vienna. We are now more than uh, 45 people. And the number we are really, really proud about is that with all of our uh, current uh, customers, we are allowed to track, we are tracking more than 30 billion euros uh, regarding revenue tracking. Obviously, we have some customers. We are totally proud of them. Um, and I think it's more than uh, 70 customers right now. So we are two years young, I would say. So um, not not as big as uh, DataGuard, uh, but uh, even fast growing and helping our customers with uh, server search tracking, um, which means better data quality and uh, even compliant tracking. Um, we are really just a tool company, so we are not doing consulting like DataGuard. We are just just providing uh, the tool which helps you um, through the channel of uh, legal regulation and data quality. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I would like to begin now with the discussion and uh, I suggest that uh, you and Lorraine uh, start, as we promised <laughs> to our audience, uh, giving some food for thought by uh, overview of um, tracking technologies with a special focus on the server side tracking. So, Thomas and Lorraine, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I'm totally happy that I'm allowed to start explaining a little bit what is server-side tracking. And let's go, please, to the next slide. There are two problems we are addressing with server-side tracking. Bad data quality and new challenges regarding legal regulation. And I wanted to show you what is the problem today with data quality um, or with a bad, bad data quality. Um, your next slide, please. One, one slide more. So as you all know, especially in the online marketing environment, we are um, we want to understand what the user is doing. Um, especially we want to understand the user or the customer journey. Mirror some clicks, please. You will see exactly. So let's say we have a user, we, we uh, call her Anna, and she has a customer journey um, where we're going through, uh, <laughs> sorry for that, we're going through display, we're going through some, uh, touch points through the customer journey. Um, that is the typical way how customers are interacting with our websites, with our shops, with our products. And obviously we do not have just one customer, we do not have just one customer journey, but there are a lot of customer journeys like you see now on the screen. Uh, Mira, one click more please. Yes, exactly. But what do we see is in the real data, especially if we compare the data with other systems, that the customer journeys are totally wrong in our analytic systems and in our advertising systems. So, for example, we have ad blockers, as you see on the first customer journey, which uh, which um, avoids the tracking of some touch points. Then we have other technologies like intelligent tracking preventions. These are technologies from browsers like uh, Firefox, like Safari, they try to split customer journeys. So that means that one user in real will be two users in your analytic system and so on and so on. So it's in real 50 to 60% of your customer journeys you have already now in your analytic systems and advertising systems are just wrong. Mira, let's try to make some more clicks, please. Yeah, and you see here, um, nearly every customer journey is affected by this one. And at the end, we have even the problem that um, we have bad data, but we are losing data because of no consent. So we are just looking to around 80, 85% of the data because we have around 85% consent. And then it's really important that these 85% are correct and we should not miss 50 to 60% of the customer journeys. Please, let's go to the next slide. Exactly, oh, and the second, yeah. Yeah, sorry, the second uh, problem we are addressing is legal regulation. Here, service side tracking can help, uh, but I would ask Lauren to to tell us a little bit more about the the challenges here, because Lauren obviously is is the expert to that topic. 
Yes, yeah, I... before, uh, sorry, Lori, I just want to remind our audience that um, please feel free to ask questions. There is a special question button in the uh, GoToWebinar um, interface. Uh, feel free to ask any questions about the topic. Uh, Lori, sorry for interrupting you. Please no problem, continue. thank you. Yes, as legal expert, I can obviously not help you with your data quality, but I might help you with um, being compliant with all legal regulation. Um, as website or app provider, um, you must ensure that all requirements of the general data protection regulation are met when processing personal data. At the same time, website and app providers are providers of telemedia services under the telecommunication telemedia data Protection Act TTDSG in Germany or the Telecommunication Act TKG in Austria, which regulates the use of cookies. Um, while the GDPR serves to protect personal data, the TTDSG and the TKG regulates the use of cookies by means of which information is stored on the terminal equipment, so on your laptop, on your mobile phone, and so on. And that regardless of whether this information is personal or not. That means whenever you set a cookie, you have to respect the TTDSG or the TKG. Um, I think the TTDSG and the TKG primarily protects the integrity of devices and protects them from unauthorized um, access. In this respect, the two acts can be compared to the integrity of the home um, set down in Article 13 of the Ch um, German Basic Law Deutsches Grundgesetz, which protects against unauthorized access of the apartment. And the TTG and the TTDSG and the TKG um, protects unauthorized access of your devices. However, the processing of personal data following the collections um, to create, create user profiles or to do what you do with the data is not covered by the TTDSG and the TKG. This processing is fully subject to the GDPR, um, which regulates the handling of the personal data. Um, of course, the TTDSG or the TKG and the GDPR apply alongside each other. So you have to respect both of them. Um, on the next side, you can see that another big problem is the transfer of data outside of the EU. In Europe, Many efforts are being made to protect personal data. We have built a wall to protect the data processed in the European Union, a bubble if you want. And the European legislators do actually not want um, personal data to leave this European protection, data protection bubble. Um, the fear is that the data outside the EU will not be protected in the same way as in Europe. However, in view of international trade and cooperation, it is essential these days to be able to transmit data to third countries, especially since many social media platforms um, and advertising networks are based in the US, like Facebook or Google, or in China, for example, like TikTok. Um, the legislators therefore created possibilities that companies can use to transfer data to third countries. All of these possibilities have the same goal, to establish a comparable level of data protection in the third country as in Europe. Um, but of course, not all third countries are the same. Um, you must uh, differentiate between secure and unsecure third countries. Secure third countries are those for which the European Commission has confirmed a suitable level of data protection on the basis of an adequacy decision. In those countries, national laws provide a level of protection for personal data which is comparable to those of the EU in the view of the European um, Commission. The third countries which ensure an adequate level of protection are, for example, Argentina, Israel, South Korea. Data transfer to these countries is permitted. The country we most want to send data to is not on the list, unfortunately. It's the United States of America. Um, small history lesson, there have already been two adequacy decisions for the US, but both were declared invalid by the European Court of Justice. In 2000, the so-called Safe Harbor Agreement was adopted, which was, which was declared invalid in 2000, 
2015, the so-called Schrems 1 decision. In 2016, the privacy shield with stricter requirements came into force. This agreement was declared invalid by the European Court of Justice in 2020, the Schrems 2 decision. Data transmissions to the US can, cannot therefore be based on an adequacy decision. Right now, the European Union and the United States of America are making a third attempt to make the data transfer legally secure in March 2022. So this spring, they agreed on the Transatlantic Data Privacy Framework. On the basis of this Transatlantic Data Privacy Framework, another adequacy decision is to be issued, which, which is expected at the end of the year. Um, I think all privacy experts are only waiting on Schrems 3, um, and I think it might be only a matter of time when this transatlantic data privacy framework is again challenged um, in front of the European Court of Justice. If there's no adequacy decision for a country, this does not necessarily foreclose any data transfer to this country. Rather, the controller, the website provider in our case, must ensure in another way that the personal data will be sufficiently protected by the recipient. This can be assured by using standard contractual clauses, SCCs. Unfortunately, however, it is not sufficient to just sign the contract. By signing the SCC, you commit to completing a transfer impact assessment, TIA, and to implement supplementary measures if necessary to protect the data. And one, in my opinion, most effective supplementary measure is server-side tracking as offered by Gentis. So Thomas, what exactly is server-side tracking? Uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, Mira, let's let's go to the next slide, please. I think we are seeing here the classical way of client-side tracking, because what I want to show you to you is what is the difference between the tracking you're already using now, most of you, and what is then server-side tracking. So in the classical way of tracking, you're implementing a lot of pixels directly to your website, which means they are running directly in the browser of the user, collect data there, and send the data directly to the data receivers, most of them in the United States which means that you have, because the pixels are running in the browser, you have maybe a problem with page speed, maybe a problem with SEO. And of course, you're not in the control of this process because these pixels, this, this JavaScripts are collecting the data by themselves and sending the data directly, and you are never in control of this data. Next slide, please. Server-side tracking means that we are, have a machine in the middle. So um, instead of have 20, 30 pixels um, implemented on the browser uh, side, you just implement one um, script, which is the Gentis script in, in our case, which is a first party JavaScript, which is combined and fully integrated with consent management. So here we are collecting data you want to collect. Then we send the data to a server side tracking machine to test server in the middle. And here you have fully control to the data because here you can set up what you want to do with the data. You can modify the data, you can clear the data, and obviously you can share the data with all the data receivers you need for your online marketing stack. So one click warrant, then we will see um, the server sends the data then to the, let's say, same uh, marketing stack than you're using with client, so, uh, with client uh, tracking approach. Next slide, please. What are the advantages? So as I told you, um, you're fully in control um, what you're gonna do with the data, and that's very, very important regarding GDPR and e-privacy and TTDSG and all the other laws. Um, because if you are not in control of the data, how you ever could guarantee something to your customers, to your visitors. The second uh, big advantage is, um, as I told you, page speed. So you will increase uh, the page speed, you will improve the page speed. Um, that's, uh, that's really cool because you will see positive effects on your uh, SEO. Um, and of course, because you're not implementing so much on your front end, even uh, you won't need that much internal IT resources as you need with client side tracking. Next slide, please. Exactly. What is very important here that this system is really working or this concept is really working, this server-side tracking 
machine must be provided by a European company and must uh, be in Europe. So it's not enough just to have um, a server standing in Europe, that's not enough. So even the company and the server must be European entities. Then you can track 100% uh, GDPR compliant and you can track 100% e-privacy compliant. Um, I think one last slide, exactly. Um, if you think to your future, um, I strongly believe that the technology behind shouldn't decide which tools you're allowed to use. So you should be free to decide which tools you want to use. And if you want to use Google Analytics or if you want to use LinkedIn and Facebook and whatever, you should be free to do so. So that's very important regarding server-side tracking. There are many, many connectors you can use. So with Gentis, we have now more than 70 connectors and they are growing day by day. Um, that is one of our focus regarding the technology that you can use the tools you really want to use and the technology is not forcing to you to use other tools um, but at the end we can go to the next slide um, at the end you see when we make first body data when we track first body data we solve we can solve both uh, problem uh, areas like legal regulation and like uh, data quality. But the very, very important message here is um, that um, server-side tracking is always just a tool. So like Chantis, we are offering you to configure what you ever want to do with the data. So with Chantis, you can be fully compliant, you can be not compliant. So what we are doing is we pushing you to the driver's seat to take control to make decisions and to be to have the chance to be compliant and to have the chance to uh, get the right data in your house um, but the question is which decisions do you have to make and how to use these control possibilities on your side and that is exactly mira i think what we want to answer with the next seven steps we cannot hear you Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, exactly. So thank you, uh, Laureen, Thomas, for this really uh, deep dive into server-side tracking. Um, it, it is, as Thomas said, very important to uh, be able to drive this machine and uh, be able to achieve the data quality by server-side tracking, as well as uh, not um, forget about the compliance and actually the server-side tracking enhances compliance. Um, so uh, let us go through the steps uh, how to drive this uh, car of uh, server-side tracking. Uh, first step we have discussed was um, what do we need to think of, which data uh, do we need to collect, or how, how do we make sure that we collect the right data. Thomas, I think you would have a really good technical insight on this aspect. Yeah, very important here once again is that Chantis never can tell you which data to collect. What we are offering to you is to help you to track data and to organize this data that you have for the first time and, and a good overview about which data you are tracking. I, I strongly believe that most companies out there has no ideas which data are, are tracked by the by the pixels, by the client side pixels. So we call it variables, so you organize your variables with, with server-side tracking and you see for the first time really which data are going to you as a data controller and what you want to share with others. Um, so again, we are not helping with which data you want to collect, we are just helping with how to collect the data and how the data are organized. Um, Lorraine, I think um, you could have an input about the how to make data collection in a compliant way because there is this principle of minimization under GDPR. How do you achieve it uh, given the technical flexibility that Gentis offers? Yes, data minimization is one of the core principles of the GDPR. It means that the collected data is GPR says adequate, relevant, relevant, and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purpose for which they are processed. Um, it would be inadmissible to simply collect all the data that could technically be collected. Um, for example, in an online store, um, only personal data that is absolutely necessary for the ordering process may be collected. You don't need the exact date of birth to sell someone socks. Another example is um, when you fill in a free text field in a questionnaire, for example, in a compliant form on a website. 
it is technically possible to track what the user writes in this field before it is submitted and even then when it is deleted again. So the website provider can technically see what you wanted to write but didn't send. And that's a clear violation of the principle data minimization. As Thomas has already mentioned, um, you have to know what data you are processing and you're not allowed to process and collect more data than are necessary for the purpose. Um, if you're using a Google tool, Google um, Cookie, for example, on your website, you have absolutely no idea what kind of personal data is collected. And so you can't decide um, because you don't even know um, if those data are really necessary for the purpose um, you're collecting them. And with Chantis, it is possible to know what kind of data um, you are collecting and also to set, set the settings up in a way that you only collect the data who are necessary for the, for the purpose. Yeah, I think, uh, Lauren, you are talking about the second step, really define the purpose of the data collection. So uh, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit more how do you define the purpose? Yes, um, another very important principle is um, the purpose limitation. That means that the personal data should be collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes and not further processed in a manner that is not incompatible with those beforehand defined purposes. Um, this means that data may only be used for the purposes for which it was collected. Um, if the data is only collected for the purposes for the purpose of processing an order like the socks in the web store, it would not be allowed to use this data later for targeting activities, for example. Um, if you want to use the data for both purposes, you have to inform the data subject before you collect the data. Um, of course, the both principles, data minimization and purpose limitation goes hand in hand. Um, however, in order to do justice to the mentioned principle, you must ask yourself beforehand, before what you want to achieve by using a certain tool. Um, what you have to ask, what is the purpose of the processing activity? In the second step, um, you have to check whether only the data that is necessary to achieve this beforehand defined purpose is really transferred. Um, if you use server-side tracking, you can decide for yourself what data you collect about your website visitors and what data you send to an advertising network like Google, for example. Um, and it is your responsibility as websites provider, as controller in the sense of the GDPR, not to send more data um, than necessary for your purpose. Um, of course, it's not enough to think about the purposes and what data you're collecting. Um, you must also be able to demonstrate compliance with the principles. Um, so you do not only need to consider what data you're collecting and why you're collecting them and to whom you're sending them, you also have to write down your considerations um, in order to comply with the documentation requirements. Yeah, um, Thomas, how, do Gen how does Gentis support uh, the customers to, uh, in defining the purpose or you know, showing the purpose of data yeah, collection? Yeah, from a technical perspective, it's much more um, important to handle the purposes in a right way with the content management platform because there are then functionality behind it, what to do, when to get a content, when to not get a content, or when to ask for a content. Regarding server-side tracking, I think it's really important that we help our customers with uh, with the with the overview. So, um, in in our world, we are we are talking about tools like Google Analytics, like Facebook, like TikTok and um, even about instances of tools so not to go too deep but you can uh, use google analytics one time for let's say your internal analytics and you have a second instance of google analytics for your agencies for example um, and important is um, with changes you can um, you can um, use or you can select the purpose per instance of the tool but there is no functionality behind but it's more for your overview and for your documentation uh, purposes that you are aware about um, when I'm tracking data with this instance to let's say agencies uh, regarding Google Analytics why I'm doing that so you can select the purpose uh, exactly on that point in Gentis. 
Thank you, Thomas. I think another important point is the modification of data on the server side and tracking on the server side. Uh, what, what are the technical aspects of data anonymization, pseudonymization, Thomas? That's that's a huge topic for server side tracking because for the first time you are really in a position to do that um, with client side. Unfortunately, it's not possible um, to understand what is the difference between data anonymization and pseudonymization. With anonymization, that is something we are offering. You can do anonymization with Genty, so you can go to a variable used for Google Analytics, for example, and you can anonymize this variable before you're sending it to Google Analytics. But I want to be totally open with you. Anonymization, especially um, for the purpose of online marketing, in most of the cases makes no sense because it's a void to track users and sessions. And if you talk with a marketing guy and you say, I'm, I'm tracking data to you, but I do not track users and session, then it won't be really a value for him or for her. So what is really, really important for us is the, the area of pseudonymization. And with Shantis, you can do that. And pseudonymization and Lauren will tell us a little bit more, I hope, uh, but from a technical perspective, it means that we are sending data to data receivers where they cannot make the re-identify to a user, but we are storing the two keys um, at Chantis. So we are not offering um, the keys, we are not offering what was, for example, the original user ID, but we are generating a new user ID, sending the new user, but we can send all the time the same new user ID, which brings us in a position that we can track users and sessions, but these users and sessions are not re-identifiable by the data receiver. And that is exactly what is pseudonymization, which you can do with Gentis per variable and per tool. So let me give you an example to really understand that one. You can say the order ID, for example, I want to pseudonymize when I'm tracking it to Google, but I don't want to, to change the order ID if I'm tracking it to Adform or to another European uh, data receiver. So you can make your decisions per variable, per data um, entity, um, crossing the tools. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Lorraine, um, what is your take uh, on data anonymization and pseudonymization? I think it's important to understand the difference between anonymization and pseudonymization. Um, anonymization is the iteration of personal data in such a way that this data can no longer be attributed to an identified or identifiable person. What is an identifiable person? I will explain it with a short example, um, and it very depends on, on, the, on, the, on the individual case. Um, for example, uh, anonymous certification survey um, of the employees with questions like how happy are you with your manager and so on. Um, and of course, you were told that it is 100% anonymous. Um, if the survey is asking about the department and the gender of the employee, um, for example, um, the data is anonymous if there are more than, for example, 100 men in the HR department, um, then the survey is truly anonymous. If there's only one man in the HR de department, it is obviously not anonymous because this person might be identifiable. Pseudonymization is defined in a GDPR. Um, it means the processing of personal data in such a manner that the personal data can no longer be attributed to a specific data subject without the use of additional information provided that such additional information is kept separately and is subject to technical and organizational measures to ensure that the personal data are not attributed to an identified and identifiable person. So um, you have to keep the information, the data, and the information to identify the data um, separately. So you're sending the pseudonymized data to Google, for example, but you keep this additional information you need to identify um, the person. Um, in the brief phase of the GDPR, you find a comment that shows how the GDPR stands on anonymized and pseudonymized data. Um, and it, it says, personal data which have undergone pseudonymization should be considered to be information on an identifiable person. This means for you that pseudonymized data is personal data. So even if the data is pseudonymized before being transferred to a processor, 
the GDPR must be respected. Um, but the principles of the GDPR do not apply to anonymous data. Um, so if you, if you possess only statistical data, for example, which is completely anonymous, you don't have to worry about GDPR. Hmm, thank you. This is uh, really insightful. So uh, let us talk about the third party vendors. Uh, how do you decide with whom and how can you control uh, with whom you share data? Thomas. Yeah, from a technical perspective, it's very easy and short to answer because, as I told you, we have these 70 connectors um, and we have these variables where all the data are stored and tracked and processed through the system of Chantis. And all you have to do is to decide which data I want to share with which uh, data receiver, third party tool, in which uh, manner. So if you want to pseudonymize, uh, pseudonymize the data or not. Um, and um, I think that is what uh, Chainless can do. And obviously, with Chainless, it's not necessary if you install Google Analytics, for example, to go through all the purposes, what you want to do. But there is something like a default tracking we offer to our customers. So we ask the customer, do you want to set up the default Google Analytics tracking? Yes. And then you have around 17 tags and around 100 variables, which are set up fully automatically. But you can go always to the tags, to the variables, and change what you want to change. Mm -hmm. um, Lorin, why is it important to be in control of these uh, sharing practices? I think that's almost the most important question asked today, um, and one that every company should ask again, again, and again. With whom do I share the data? Um, recently, a wave of warning letters swept over Germany and Austria. Um, the reason was the use of Google Fonts. Um, and this use of Google Fonts can involve the transfer of personal data to Google. According to a ruling um, by the Munich Regional Court, this is illegal. And in that case, ruled by the um, court in Munich, the plaintiff has received damages um, of 100 euro. Um, this was taken. Um, as an opportunity by some lawyers to check the websites of many, many companies in Germany and Austria. And all companies that use Google Fonts in the same way um, were asked to pay 100 euro. Um, the problem is that many recipients of such letters did not even know that they were transferring data here. And that's a big problem. Um, DataGuard is regularly um, checking the websites of its customer. And if we detect a tool that is transferring personal data, we first ask whether this tool is being used at all. And it is quite often the case that external agencies, for example, that created the website simply activate all common tools just to activate them because everyone is using it. And this regardless of whether the tool has any added value for the company or not. Um, and that sometimes without um, the company even knowing that a tool is in use and that the tool is transferring data. Um, and that's a big problem um, because as a controller, as a website provider, as a company, you need to know with whom you are sharing what kind of data. And if you don't know um, who you're sharing data with, you never can be privacy compliant. It's impossible. Um, so my approach is that anyone who is not 100% 100% compliant with privacy because he has made the informed decision to take a certain risk for the success of the business might be a risk averse entrepreneur. Um, but anyone who is not compliant with privacy just because he simply does not know what data he is sending where is, pardon my French, just stupid um, or in legal terms, grossly negligent. So it's very important to know who you are sharing data with. Yeah, I think I also think it's a very important question. And also in the uh, in view of next steps, I just want to remind our audience that we have now about maybe five to seven minutes into this uh, interview uh, left. And I just ask you to, if you have any questions, just go ahead and post them in the chat function. We will then we will now talk about. Um, the further three steps of um, how to achieve the data quality and data compliance simultaneously. And the next step is consent. So how to get a compliant consent from the user, Lauren? Yeah, 
So as I mentioned before, as a rule, cookies may only be set with consent. Um, there are, of course, certain um, exceptions, but they are not relevant in our case of tracking or server-side tracking. So in our case, you always need um, consent. And the consent must be active, explicit, informed, um, voluntary, and prior. Um, and even if the data is not transmitted directly to a third party, but um, via a server, uh, uh, another um, server, in the, like server-side tracking, um, you need the consent. Um, how to get the consent? With the everywhere loved cookie um, banner. Recently, you can now enjoy um, cookie banners by watching TV. Um, I was very surprised to see these cookie banners um, on my television. And to recheck these cookies, we, you really um, need to know your remote control um, very well. It was not easy, but finally I find out. I found out how to recheck the cookies. Um, for content to be effective, several conditions must be met. Um, the first one is priority. Um, that means processing may only take place after consent has been given. No data may be transferred before consent has been given by the user. This means that it must be technically ensured that no cookies are stored in the browser while the content banner is displaced or even if the um, content is rejected. Um, the next condition is voluntary. The data topic must um, the data subject must consent freely. Um, the ref refusal must not um, must not be more difficult than granting um, the content. Um, and it also means that the user must not be influenced um, to give their consent. Um, and this might be the case, for example, if the one button is very big and green and the other button is um, very small and, and red. Um, this is called nudging and the authorities don't like that. Um, another condition is that um, the user must be informed um, and the information must be provided about the procedures and the processing in a transparent manner. That means that you have to explain every single cookie, what is the purpose of the cookie, what, which data is collected with the cookie, and also the privacy policy where you find all this information must be available even if the cookie banner is just shown. Um, another um, condition is the active consent. Um, must be given actively. Um, it, it's not allowed to preset um, the content. An opt-in is required and not an opt-out. Um, it must also be separated from other declaration. So you can't just have one click box where you write um, with clicking the box, I accept the terms of conditions. I accept that um, my email address is used for um, our newsletter. And of course, I'm um, accepting all the all the cookies. So for each um, consent, you need a separately given consent. Um, and lastly, it must be withdrawable. It, it must be withdrawable. So after the cookie is after the consent for the cookies are given, it must be possible in a very easy technical way to withdraw the consent afterwards. So there must be a possibility on the website that you can reach the cookie settings after given the consent. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, there are so many conditions to consent. Yeah. Um, Thomas, how is it achieved uh, through the Gentis software? Yeah, we, we made it very easy for us here uh, because of there are so many conditions um, and because there are really good tools out there. I think about user centric CookieBot, OneTrust, for example. We decided very early when we uh, when we worked on Chantis that uh, instead of offer an own content management tool, we want to uh, be sure that we can bridge to all the other tools out there. So if you're using Chantis, you can go to Chantis very easily, select user centric cookie bot, whatever, and we fully automatically can connect to these tools in the front end, get the consent information, send the consent information with the tracking stream and the server side tracking then knows what is allowed to do and what's not. So that's very simple um, and in respect to time, very short answer. Yes, uh, we're now running out of time and the time flies so fast. 
Uh, there are two last aspects that uh, we need to ensure uh, when we are using server-side tracking, and this is international data transfers and documentation. And um, I just want uh, Lauren uh, to um, briefly address the international data transfers framework for uh, compliance server-side tracking, as well as the documentation that you would need to make sure is reflecting the compliance. Yes, as I mentioned before, um, of course, all of you want to transfer the data to the third countries. And if the, this is an unsecure third country like the US, um, you need, you need um, standard contractual clauses, SECs. Um, unfortunately, however, as I also mentioned before, it's not, not sufficient just to sign the contract um, because by signing the contract, you weren't that you have no reason to believe that the laws and practices in the third country prevent the data importer, so the person who is getting the recipient of the data from, from fulfilling its obligation under the clauses set in the um, SECs. Um, um, and you also declare that in providing sovereignty that you have taken certain elements into consideration. And this taking into consideration is called transfer impact assessment, TIA. And of course, you must be, um, the transfer impact assess assessment must be documented. You must be able to um, make it available to the authority if they ask for it. Um, if you perform a transfer impact ass assessment for the US or for China, you must necessarily conclude that you cannot provide the aforementioned guarantee without implementing supplementary measures to protect the data. Um, and one of the most effective measures to, is to sodomize the data before the transfer so the recipient or an authority um, like the CIA um, is accessing the data cannot make a personal connection. And I think the only way to send sodomized um, data to tracking providers or advertising networks or social networks is through the use of server-side tracking. Thomas, uh, what is your take on these two aspects? Very important, here is one additional point we didn't mention today. Um, we very often hear the argument, guys, is it really effective to pseudonymize the data because um, you are sending timestamps and there is the timestamp problem. Let me explain it in a very short, if you click on a Google ad um, and immediately we would send from the website a Google Analytics stream back to Google, Google could, because of the timing, um, understand that it is just the same user. And here a technology came in place which makes me really proud that we can offer that to our users. Um, which is called time framing, which means that we can wait with the hits to Google, for example, until we have hits from 10 or 20 or 50 users, and then we send these hits at the same time. So, so we can avoid that because of the timestamp, somebody else like Google could understand that it is the same user. That is very effective, that is very unique uh, at Chantis, um, and I'm totally happy that we can um, offer that to our customers. Great. Um, now, really, thanks a lot for this. Um, uh, the most important aspects of the server-side tracking of how to achieve the data quality and data compliance simultaneously. I mean, uh, for me, uh, as a person who is involved in, deeply in the data protection and legal aspects of Gentis, I think it's um, even more important to, to kind of have this type of um, uh, educating activities where we really talk about what, what do you need to do in order to set up the server-side tracking correctly. Um, we now have 10 minutes for the question and answer and then we will wrap up at uh, exactly 12. Um, I do not see any questions, <laughs> uh, but you know, I can ask the two maybe more frequently asked questions by our customers to me as a legal counsel. And one is for Thomas, I think he will be in, in the best position to answer it. So um, I'm usually asked, there are so many other tools offering server-side tracking. How is Gentis different? Um, I would answer it with two, two uh, these are two answers. The one is, that I, I strongly believe that we have um, a much, much better technology, which means that it's much easier with Gentis to really 
track data um, and to share the data with uh, third-party tools. Um, we have a fully focus from beginning when we developed Gentis to the legal regulation. And they, that makes us really proud that with Gentis, it's not feeling like you have to decide if I want to go in the direction of data quality or in the direction of, of legal regulation, but you can do same uh, at the same time. And the second point is, as we mentioned before, um, obviously, it's important that it's a European company. Otherwise, all the things Lauren and me talked about today just don't work. You cannot send the data to a US tool to avoid to send data to US, right? Um, that is the problem. And um, I think even to be really um, a proud European company, the whole hosting, so the cloud servers are in Europe. We're really using just IONOS in the Germany, um, uh, in Germany, or um, Exascale in Austria, which are really original European cloud systems. So that makes us proud and that makes us unique. Thank you, Thomas. I now received a question from the audience, which I think would be best answered by Loreen. And the question is, what would the authority look for when reviewing a tracking tool based on a complaint? Yeah, um, the first thing is that, and that is why it is so important to be compliant, that it is very obvious obvious, obvious for everyone visiting your website um, whether you are compliant or not, whether the consent um, is, um, the consent bar is set in a compliant way and so on. And it takes only five minutes to make a complaint. And then the authority has to get active. And what are they doing? I think the first thing they're doing is to um, check all the documentations. So it's your obligation to document everything. Um, you have to document um, whether the consent is given or not. Um, you have to inform your customers or your website visitors about the data processing. So checking, they're checking your privacy policy. Um, you have to mention um, the data processing activity in your um, um, record of processing activities. Um, so you have to provide that. And um, of course, they're checking whether you have um, the SECs concluded, including the transfer impact assessment. And after checking all the tools, they will determine um, whether or not you're using um, a certain tool like Google Analytics in a um, compliant way or not. If you're not using it compliant, they may impose a fine or just order you to stop it immediately. Um, in my um, experience, they are in the most cases happy to see that you have supplementary measures um, to protect the data like server-side tracking. So oh. if you have that in place, I'm pretty sure that um, they won't impose a fine or be unhappy at all with the transfer of the data. Yeah, so, uh, you know, just to kind of uh, summarize what you have just said, the, you know, the Data Protection Authority would actually look, if we read the decisions of Google, on Google Analytics, for example, we could see that the Data Protection Authority looked not only into legal, um, documentation, but they also actually looked on the setup of Google, how it was really done uh, technically. And I think this is a very important aspect that it's no longer only about the legal aspect, but it's also about the technical uh, setup. So, um, and the legal aspect is so closely connected to technical setup that you have to be really transparent and um, holistic about uh, the tools and the supplementary measures you are using. Exactly. And that's the reason why you need to, you need the know-how in your company or you need two kinds of partners. You need a company that is providing you the technical environment that, that you can be compliant. And then you need a legal expert and privacy expert that explains you how to use this tool in a compliant way. And only then, um, you can be sure to, to track your um, website visitors in a privacy compliant way. Yeah, and ideally these two uh, consultants or these two parts of the organization need to really work and collaborate together in order to uh, achieve compliance and quality. Exactly. Yeah, unfortunately we only have time um, left for saying, you know, wrapping up and saying goodbyes. And uh, I just want to uh, ask you, 
Thomas and Lauren, maybe to give you to give like a couple of takeaways. What do you want to the audience to live with uh, this webinar? What are your um, final tips, Thomas? For, from my perspective, um, it's the most important thing to understand that you have to uh, take the driver's seat. Um, you have to be in control. If you're not in control, then everything what Lauren told us today, you're just not able to do. Um, and that is um, very easy to understand for each data protection authority. Um, are you in control of your data or not? So that is a technical question that is a technical solution that you should use to be in control of your data and then in the second step it is really important to use the possibilities what you have because you are in control of the data so it's not enough um, to implement a server-side tracking um, it's not enough to um, say i'm in control of the data that's a basic requirement but in the second step you must then take good decisions to execute the decisions and to really understand what is the requirement regarding gdpr e privacy and the other laws to you thank you thomas Lorin. i think that's exactly the most important point thomas just said um you are the controller so in the terms of the gdpr you are called the controller you are responsible for all the data you are processing and transferring and um as company, as entrepreneur, you have so many risks you're living with, and this is just an avoidable risk. So don't put another risk on your plate. Um, don't have another reason you can't sleep at night because it's so easily avoidable um, to, to have those risks. So know what data you are collecting, know where you are transferring the data to, and then I think everything will be fine. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, for our audience, if they have questions about today's webinar, um, as a follow-up, uh, how do they find you, Lauren? Yeah, you can um, go on our website, um, datagut.com um, or DE or whatever, um, or Google us, <laughs> and then um, there are many channels to, co to connect us. Um, yeah, and uh, Thomas, uh, if you want to announce, may maybe somebody is in Köln uh, in of a couple course. of weeks. Yeah, of course. So we are at the Mexico, so please just write us and uh, I'm happy to meet every, everybody at the Mexico. Uh, it should be a really good party there. Um, obviously, I am uh, personally on LinkedIn, so just write me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat with you. And uh, last but not least, uh, go to our website, chances.com. We have uh, the possibilities for demos there. So if you um, if you want to see how Chantis is working, then just book a demo there and you will uh, see with one of our solution architects uh change this um really the interface and not just because i'm talking about that one thank you and um the time flew so fast today it's uh, unbelievable when the topics are really interesting how fast it can go right um i just want to thank you lauren and thomas for this insightful discussion but i also want to thank people behind the camera <laughs> and all of the uh, participants who are here today, I hope um, to hear from you in the nearest future or see you in the, at the next call. Um, so, and I'm really looking forward to next uh, future exchanges like this. Um, yeah, thank you so much for attending our webinar. Thank you, Mio, for hosting. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.